There are a lot of things that us Aussies are known for, like our spectacular beaches, the strange things we put on our toast, but most disappointingly, we have a shocking track record when it comes to defending ourselves against cybercrime. Today, we're going to have a look at a significant data breach that happened at Australia's top university and talk to a senior analyst from the Australian Strategic Policy Institute about just what happened. But first, welcome to another episode of Hacking History. If this is the type of content you like, then be sure to hit the subscribe button and ring the bell so you don't miss any future video. Australian National University, or ANU, is one of Australia's most prestigious universities, often ranked first in the country and within the top 30 institutions globally. It's situated within Australia's capital city being Canberra, which certainly isn't the most exciting city. It is home of many federal agencies, like Parliament House, Australia's form of Congress, the Australian Defence Force, the Australian Security Intelligence Organisation, otherwise known as ASIO, which is kind of like our CIA, and the Australian Signals Directorate. Often people who study at ANU will land themselves with a cadetship with one of these federal agencies upon graduation. Many people also travel from overseas to attain a world-class education from this university. Now, I'm not going to talk about this university too much, because at the end of 2018, they suffered a significant data breach, which resulted in 19 years of student records and personal information being stolen. This was a significant attack, which was highly coordinated, sophisticated, and went unnoticed for quite some time. When ANU found that they were victim of a cyber attack, they announced it within about two weeks of detection. While this certainly isn't the fastest, they claimed that this time was critical to secure their systems and prevent any copycat attacks that would be made after they made the announcement. In subsequent weeks, ANU worked with Northrop Grunman, a private American aerospace and defense company. They performed extensive forensics and produced a report to give to ANU. ANU would then later redact some of this report and then republish it to the public in hopes of it being a valuable lesson for other Australian organizations. So the following is a full timeline of the attack based on this public report. On the 9th of November 2018, a targeted phishing email, otherwise known as a spear phishing email, was sent to a senior staff member within ANU. While it's reported this email was not actually opened, it was previewed and by a different staff member. As a result, the original recipient's credentials, being their username and password, was sent to the attackers. So then between the 12th and 19th of November, the attackers found a public facing website which belonged to ANU. Using their stolen credentials they just attained, they were able to gain access to the website and then upload a web shell. Simply put, a web shell is like just a normal web page, but it will actually execute operating system commands on the actual server that runs the website. This was their initial foothold within the ANU network. As internal networks aren't exposed to the internet, by gaining access to a single system will allow attackers to use that system as their point of ingress and backdoor. So once they were inside the internal network, they could attack other computers which weren't publicly exposed to the internet. And that's exactly what the hackers did. On the 16th of November, the attackers successfully compromised another machine within the network. This was a server that was set up to run some trial software, which ultimately was never used. This server was planned to be retired, but at the time of the attack, it was still active. The machine was also compromised using the stolen credentials they attained on the 9th. They continued to exploit the machine and get root level privileges on it. This machine would then be built out and referred to as attack station one. For the next week or so, they would create a strong foothold in the network by downloading all their required tools. The attackers turned attack station one into a virtual machine host which allowed them to deploy multiple virtualized computers on top of it. Evidence shows that they installed both Windows XP and Kali Linux. Kali Linux is the most popular hacking operating system. With Attack Station 1 now built out, they began mapping the full internal network, and they also gained access to the network's LDAP information. This is like a phone book that contained information all about the users and computers on that network. Although it appears that after all this, the hackers still couldn't attain what they were after, 
So then they proceeded with another spearfishing attempt, and this happened on the 25th and 26th of November. The email was crafted for only 10 people within the university that the attackers believed would have the right credentials. The email was titled Invitation and sent within the ANU mail server, which made it bypass spam filters and appear more legitimate. This second spear phishing attack would be somewhat successful with another set of credentials being attained. However, the account didn't have the right level of access for the target. So with those credentials ruled out, the attackers would risk making a little bit more noise in the network and start trying to hack into more machines. On the 27th of November, they were successful at attaining another set of credentials that would allow them to access an ESD file share. They also gained multiple working sets of credentials for other file shares, but these were ignored for some reason. So the ESD file share appeared to somewhat be an unmanaged share, where staff would save files to and use to share between staff members and other computers. It mostly contained staff and HR records, which appeared to somewhat be what the attackers wanted, but there was a database which stored all the HR, finance and student administration records amongst other information. This would be the holy grail that the attackers were after. Significant effort was spent trying to access this system, going as far as writing custom exploit code along with extensive password cracking attempts. Eventually, they gained access by exploiting software existing on that system. Once in, they would proceed to extract as much information from the database that they could, sending the files to unknown locations by using a Tor network which would hide the destination IP address of where the files were actually going. While it appeared that the attackers achieved their main objective, they weren't quite done yet. On the 29th of November, a third spear phishing email was sent. The attackers were now looking for some more credentials that they could use in the network, ideally with admin privileges. Between the 29th and 13th of December, the attackers were rather quiet on the network. And it's likely that they used this as an opportunity to clean up any evidence and delete system logs which would indicate their intrusion. However, despite these efforts, by the 13th of December, they would have lost their access to attack station 1 due to a system administrator cutting them off. Although the attackers were cut off, the system administrator actually had no clue that their routine maintenance resulted in the removal of the attacker's back door. They were simply carrying out planned maintenance and hadn't actually noticed anything abnormal. But with the loss of attack station one, the attackers would need to find a way back in. And sure enough, between the 13th and 20th of December, that's exactly what they did. While they still had access to the original web shell, they were able to compromise a computer running a legacy operating system within another school of the university. This time, the attackers acted faster to exfiltrate data from the network. They also prepared the system to conduct further attacks, and this was then labeled attack station two. A fourth spear phishing email attempt would take place on the 21st of December. Still trying to find more administrator accounts, they sent out 40 phishing emails now to ANU staff with the suspected level of access. This email contained a Word document and in that document contained a macro. If opened, the macro would run and help the attackers gain the credentials and access to that machine. Once again, the attackers were successful and gained another administrator account. Meanwhile, some ANU administrators noticed some abnormal activity coming from attack station two and proceeded to investigate. And this is when they found out that they had been breached. The administrators would quickly remove the attacker's access, cutting them off to attack station two and presumably the web shell as well. Though the attackers would continue to try and make their way back into the network. And this happened between the 22nd of November until March 2019, when it appears that they finally gave up. The attackers were persistent and within the ANU network for about two months which gave them plenty of time to hunt for what they were looking for and to exfiltrate what they needed. While they stole up to 20 years worth of data, nothing to date has actually shown up on the dark web. So it's expected that the people behind this attack wanted this data for some reason. On top of the reputational damage, ANU were put in a position where they had to spend millions on updating their systems to protect themselves from attacks in the future. So just who was behind this attack? Well, nobody at ANU formally accused anybody. However, it didn't stop others from pointing the finger quite quickly. Political tensions between Australia and China have been escalating over the years. 
The Australian government on both sides of the House have taken a hard line stance to protect the nation from foreign political interference, much to the anger of Beijing. While I do like to dabble a bit in politics, I'm certainly not qualified to speak much of it. So I've reached out to Tom Oran from the Australian Strategic Policy Institute to chat about the ANU breach and the ramifications it's had with our relationship with China. Uh, yeah, so my name is Tom Oran. I'm a senior analyst at the International Cyber Policy Centre at the Australian Strategic Policy Institute. So mostly we're focused on the very big picture, um, you know, how cyber security relates to national security and also the geopolitics. Did you think the the report was really showing the full picture? I think any report shows what people can show. And, and my gut feeling was that there was things that they had good looking for mm. and other things that, that they just simply didn't. I think it was very good that they talked about what they did know, mm -hmm. um, but the, there were just gaps. You... Uh, were a bit vocal in the media and said uh, that this seemed to be a state-sponsored attack um, by China. Now, is this a, is this still the case? Do you still think that they are the main probable culprit behind it? So, for any breach um, nowadays, you know, there's a group of cyber criminals who want to get money, and there's a group of states who want to try and get some advantage. And usually, if it's criminals getting advantage, you, you see something that indicates that they're trying to get money. So nowadays, ransomware is super common. Mm. So, uh, or you see the data appearing on the dark web. So when you don't see that, you kind of think that, well, they're not trying to monetize it immediately. So it's probably a state that's got some other um, interest. Mm. Um, the usual culprits, well, when I say the usual culprits, the culprits that have been named um, and we have good evidence for in the past are China mm -hmm. and Iran, particularly around university breaches. Um, so either is possible. Um, China has just got more um, more interest in Australia, so it's, it's more likely. Why do you think a new Vice Chancellor, Professor Brian Schmidt, didn't really want to point the finger at anyone or nation specifically in the media? I guess there's two facts. One is he probably um, he, might, he may not know. Mm. So uh, there may be national security people who have a, a better idea and maybe they haven't told Brian. Mm -hmm. um, the other big factor, especially in Australia, is that we have China's uh, biggest trading partner and they've certainly shown in recent times that they're not afraid to punish people who uh, they think uh, are speaking against their interests. It seems that the attackers weren't really interested in sort of any research data or anything in that sort of realm, and they were more after uh, data that was related to HR and uh, student enrollments. Why do you think that is? Uh, so one of the theories is that the Chinese state is particularly interested in its students who are studying overseas and that overseas students, I mean universities in general are just the hotbed mm. of you know uh, different thinking and radicalism whether it's in Australia or elsewhere so the, the one theory is that the Chinese state is interested in keeping tabs of, on its students overseas. There's another theory right. that they're after um, people who may go on to work in national security and defence jobs mm -hmm. and just having some background data allows them to better target possible other espionage in the future. If you'd like to see the full interview, this will be made available on my YouTube page three days after this video has gone live. This has to be one of the most advanced attacks I've seen on an organization, but the impacts have been costly for ANU. They've had to spend millions in upgrades, suffered from reputational damage, and have had to support their students who've likely had their data stolen. Australians are known for their relaxed way of life, and it's quite apparent that this extends to our attitude in cybersecurity as well. This data breach should act as a warning sign to other Aussie institutions and businesses to start taking cybersecurity more seriously. So be sure to subscribe to the channel to continue to learn about more past data breaches, large scale attacks, and general cybersecurity news. Leaving this video a like will help other people like you find content like this. So has your school or university been hit with a cyber attack? Be sure to let me know in the comments below and it may make its way into another episode of Hacking History. Anyway, I've been Jason from JasonSec. Thank you for watching and I'll catch you in the next one.